someone once said of me, actually someone related to me once said to me, oh, you do like the sound of your own voice, don't you? So um, I'm aware that uh, th this is quite an ego trip as well, in that it's going to be me talking exclusively for um, half an hour or so. Um, and I really won't take it amiss if you, um, if you leave for a bit, if you go off video and I just see a dark screen, or if you just leave the session, that's no, no problem at all. I'll just keep going until, until my internet connection runs out. And I, I entitled today Roger Williams in the Psychiatrist Chair um, for, for a couple of reasons. I just wanted to talk about um, how we keep ourselves positive, I suppose. Um, partly in lockdown, but partly in this um, profession in general. Uh, and I have no expertise in this area. I have no training in this area. So therefore, it, all I say is anecdotal and therefore a, a, a statistical survey of one. So you, you can take from it whatever you, you, you like. But in essence, I suppose I'm going to talk about myself, my favorite subject, and just um, you can pull from it whatever is, is useful. Um, I even talk to my children, um, my grown up children, youngest is 19, eldest is 25, um, um, about the issue of mental health because it, it appears to me, I'm 55, 54, and it appears to someone of my generations that mental health was invented as a concept in the last few years. Of course, we all know that it's, it's, it has existed before that. It doesn't seem to have had a name. Or if it did have a name, people seem to be embarrassed or reticent about talking about it. And now um, it's very much part of a, a, a popular um, a debate. And even the royal family have entered in heavily into that debate and it's given everybody permission to talk about it and, and just feel a bit more comfortable about it. Uh, so I was able to learn very quickly from my children, um, uh, uh, some of whom have sought professional help um, with uh, in their lives. Um, and so they were able to give me one or two things, able to dispel one or two illusions on my part, or just misapp misapprehensions on my part. Um, and so the, the first thing they, they did for, for an old oldie like me was just teach me the difference between mental health and mel mental illness. And I don't think I'd sort of worked that out before. And they also uh, uh, were talking about the whole concept of going to a professional or a third party for help um, it, just in order to chat things through and get a perspective. And I was asking them a little bit about that process. And for someone, again, of my vintage, the idea of going to get help from a third party, particularly a professional, um, has always smacked of um, uh, 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 trouble, trauma. And um, I, I wouldn't, the word shame is far too strong, just kind of um, something one didn't want to discuss, or we, I, I think I better go and see a doctor because I'm having trouble with my mental health, um, is, is something that I would never have thought to do myself and didn't seem to be something that was discussed much in people of, of my age and older. The, the idea of just getting on, of just bucking up, pulling your socks up and getting on with it, seemed to be more the sort of the idea until one hit the buffers with some traumatic event uh, and it all fell apart at the seams. That seemed to be how it was managed in the past, and it seems to me now that people are, that people of my uh, children's generation at least are much more open about discussing their anxieties, this, uh, uh, talking about it between each other, and also um, seeking professional help. So, as my kids put it to me, the idea, you know, if you if you hurt yourself physically, you put a plaster on, or you go to see someone and say, "Can you help me with this?" and that seems very normal and they, they say mental health is exactly the same um, and so I find myself learning a bit but actually the reason why I thought I would do this Roderick Williams in the psychiatrist chair thing is because after performances if people come up to me and say anything at all thank you very much or, or you know what happens with the top note or whatever um, one of the things they say over and over again is um, you seem to be enjoying yourself. Oh, you really seem to be enjoying yourself, they say, in that sort of way that makes me wonder if I was, if they thought I was giggling all the way through or something. And they, they say it time and time again, and 
I learnt to become comfortable in it and see it not as a sort of uh, as a criticism or anything like that, but actually as a, real, a, a sharing of enjoyment. And then it led me to realise that if they hadn't noticed that I seemed to be enjoying myself and I performed so much, then might it follow that they are used to seeing performers who are visibly not enjoying themselves? Um, and this has then led me to wonder why musicians, performers, singers in particular, why people would do it if they're not enjoying it. I, I don't quite understand that. Obviously, if people see me enjoy myself on stage, because I am enjoying myself, I have, I have, I, I, it's tremendous fun. And yes, there's nerves that, that uh, 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 with the whole performing experience too. Sure, of course, but um, I and and it is my job. It's my career. But I wouldn't do it if I didn't enjoy it. And one of the things I try to pass on in class situations with young singers. Um, is the idea that you are allowed to enjoy um, what you do, in my case, singing, in their case, singing. If someone is, is singing a beautiful song with that special sort of leader frown on their face, you know, screwed up with emotion, I, I, it, what they seem to transmit to me in the audience is that they're having a really bad time. Um, and, it sh and, and it may well be that the, 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 the piece of music, the, the subject of the poem is... is is dark and brooding so fine i understand that but people comment on the fact that i enjoy singing what i sing even when the subject matter is dark and and um and introspective they can nonetheless tell that i'm getting a, a, a great deal personally out of the performing experience so um my one of my messages my, my really big messages to young singers is that you are I think you are allowed to communicate the idea that you are enjoying performing and that if at some point, particularly having, if you have embarked upon this performing thing as a career choice, if you really begin to focus on it, if somewhere along the way you begin to realise that it doesn't give you joy, to quote Marie Kondo slightly, if, it, if it's not, if you're not enjoying it, then you really do need to ask yourself um, why you're doing it. It's a lot of effort it's a lot of training and, and a lot of time to focus in on this one particular thing and if the anxiety of it is tying you up in knots and you're not enjoying it then, then it's worth asking the question uh, for me singing is a pleasure in in many ways and, and I'll, I'll pick on two in particular one is the sheer physical pleasure of making noise and making the air vibrate so uh, part of my profession is going to some really beautiful spaces and I would particularly mention cathedrals in this or church spaces, large spaces, but any sort of room that's got a beautiful acoustic and I get to yell and scream in them. Um, can you imagine going into St Paul's Cathedral and just going, ah! just, just what it feels like to make the, the air in the entire building vibrate. It is a, it is a physical pleasure. Um, akin to um, running around in a in a hushed library and shouting at the top of your voice. I think it, you know, it's just it's just a wonderful physical thing. I think instrumentalists get that too to a certain extent, but it's just one of those things that singers have the instrument inside us. So the whole of the, the our bodies are resonating when we do it. And that is just a, a physical um, sensation that is pleasurable. And then the other thing, of course, is the music that we are singing. Um, it's uh, I'm, uh, where I'm sitting now in my music room, my, I've got my um, music shelves looking straight at me, so I see all the operas on one side and the song and oratorio on the other. All this amazing music that gives me a great buzz to listen to if I just go to concerts or have it on my um, sound system here. But the idea of taking part in it, he says, I think what I learnt from singing madrigals when I was a, a, a boy with my parents. I don't know why my dad was so interested in singing madrigals, but he, we were that middle class household that did do a bit of madrigal singing. Uh, and it is often noted that madrigals are sometimes more in, uh, um, enjoyable for the people doing them than they are for the audiences. But whatever your view on that, um, uh, we had terrific fun making, turning these dots on the page into music, making it, making it sound. And uh, 
you know, a lot of the leader repertoire that I've got is staring at me straight in the face here. Um, obviously, the Schubert I sing, the Schumann and Brahms and, and Wolf, and then uh, some of the English song on the, on the other side. It's, it's just fantastic music. And to be able to be a part of it rather than be passive, to be able to be active in it, um, gives me a huge sense of pleasure and, and, and well-being. So, so it's, it's partly the physical thing and partly the intellectual thing that, 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 um, that uh, gets me up in the morning and uh, uh, makes me uh, want to go to work because the work is going to be such a genuine pleasure. So that is that is one of the gifts of a freelance existence as, as a musician. Uh, um, you know, I get to do this um, uh, wonderful thing uh, that makes me feel so good and people pay me for it too. That's rather rather strange thing. It, in fact, uh, I have quipped on many an occasion when, I, when it's been required in interviews and what have you, I've quipped that um, singing for me has been cheaper than therapy and that was kind of where I got into this whole idea of of, of talking about music and mental health because I thought it might be a, a good moment to examine uh, if there's any truth in that quip um, because I'm aware of what uh, in, in chatting with my kids uh, about the actual process of doing this properly and going to speak to one about about things that are troubling a person or or just thoughts dealing with relationships all the things that, that would cause someone to to think I, I, I'm gonna get some help with this it, it began to occur to me that I haven't necessarily felt the need for that myself because I do a lot of it um, in my uh, profession anyway um, for me, a lot of the performance I do, particularly in, in operatic work, a lot of the performance I do is about play. And that is why I uh, take so much pleasure in rehearsals. Performance is, is, is a thing, and I do very much enjoy that. But the assembling of a piece of work, of a, of a project, um, is, is something I, 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 really, I really enjoy it. And part of that is because the the rehearsal space is a closed, safe space. All my colleagues, whether they're performing with me or whether they're part of the stage crew or the directorial team or the musical team, um, I'm thinking mainly about opera in this in this instance. Um, all of us uh, uh, know the rules of the room. Uh, we know that we can try anything together, and we trust each other. And uh, it, it is a wonderful, safe environment uh, in which to explore aspects, actually, of ourselves. Uh, I got into opera um, when I was at the Guildhall School of Music. So I was in my late 20s and about to be 13 and, and about to have my, or my wife was about to have our first child. So that stage of my life, because before then I was trained as a, a choral singer all the from the age of about um, six or seven when I first uh, met Richard uh, Van Dome at the um, at Exeter College Chapel all the way through until my late 20s I had been trained as a choral singer so a sight reading um, creature uh, 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 a quick musician and then when I went to the Guildhall to learn with my singing teacher David Pollard there I chose the opera course there because it was a two-year course and it looked like fun. You got to do combat training and um, uh, dance and uh, movement classes and prosthetics, you know, makeup and stuff, false noses and, uh, and cuts and bruises and gunshot wounds. Uh, I think I thought it looked really terrific. So I thought I'd do that. I hadn't really factored in that I'd be on stage acting, something I'd never really done before. I'd always been in the orchestral pit uh, when it came to uh, drama stuff at school. So. Uh, suddenly, out of the choir stalls, I was on stage, and I began to realise very quickly that I really enjoyed the chance to play, and to play at being other people. Uh, meaning that it was like having a, a dressing up basket, and being able to assume different characters and explore what it's like to be them for a while. Um, 
I think we we all know that part of that really is unlocking parts of yourself. You might like to think that as a wonderful actor, you can transform yourself and take on extraordinary characteristics of, and be someone completely different. And we all see someone that see the biggest challenge as an actor is being someone who you feel is re, is as remote from you as a person as possible. But nonetheless, I realize that even in those instances, I'm exploring parts of myself and allowing them to surface again in this safe environment of being in the rehearsal room. So let me give you a few for instances and, and show you a few pictures just to just to tickle. And, and let me start off with someone who you might think if you know me at all as a, as a person, uh, uh, you might think is very close to me as a character. Uh, and I get the other th the other thing I get a lot is um, oh Roderick Williams oh he's so nice isn't he nice oh yes get that a lot um, so uh, we'll we'll test that truth as well in a minute um, so Papageno let, 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 let me just this is a, a typical uh, Papageno photograph and I, I apologise for the for the slight sheen I don't know whether you can see it here uh, clearly but that's me right at the end of the opera and with uh, Papageno meets Papagena and they go off into the twilight in this happy nest. And you can see from this gleeful look of my face, if you can see that, that is, this gleeful look on my face that I'm having, uh, you know, the time of my life. And Papageno struck me, I did, I did this um, role three times. That photograph is from the English National Opera production. I had done one in Opera North just beforehand. And then more recently than that, I did one uh, at the Royal Opera House, which was the only one in, uh, of those three in German. Um, it struck me that Papageno is a, is a character who, who has eyes to see what is in front of him and hasn't really the imagination or hasn't ever had to, to use his imagination to, to see what is further afield. So whatever's in front of him, he deals with that and that alone. There are kind of no consequences to any of his actions. Um, he lives, therefore, entirely in the present. And this is a really beautiful and attractive place to be. Um, there's one moment where he he is led in at the beginning of the second act with a hood on his face when 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 he and the hero Tamina the tenor are being led into um, Sarastro's temple um, in order to take part in their trials. They're led in with hoods on, and then the hoods are whipped away. Now, while papageno has got his hood over his face, he thinks the whole world is in total darkness, because that's the extent of his knowledge and it's only when the hood is released that he sees that there are other people in the room with him it's it's an amazing place to be um he feels his emotions uh in primary colors when he's happy it's total and when he's sad it's it's despairing and he can go from happy to despairing in half a bar or less uh, and it's it's really wonderful to be able to bound through life with no feeling about consequences. You just deal what with what's right in front of you, and and uh, and yes, there is a great deal of me that is positive in that way. Uh, I and I under I, un, I understand that. I understand why people would think that of me. Oh, he's so nice. Um, but I'd also like to think that I that I have more intellectual. Um, power of thought than Papageno. Wouldn't we all like to think we've got a bit more than that? Um, let me move on to Billy Budd. Um, and I don't think I've got a nice photo of Billy here. I couldn't find one on, on, on my walls because, of course, you do realise I keep photographs of all my triumphs on my walls in the kitchen there. Um, I'll maybe come back to the narcissistic element of that later. But um, I haven't got a f photo of Billy here, but uh, I, I sang Billy but in 2016 it's a role that i had always wanted to sing but thought i might be too old for but fortunately i got one i got my chance to sing it and billy um if you, i don't know if you know the story of billy bud but um he is like an angel he's on board a royal naval ship he's press ganged onto the royal naval ship um during uh, the napoleonic wars uh, before trafalgar and um, the, sh the, the life on board ship is really hard and it, everybody is sort of, the, 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 the sailors, the working sailors are sort of ground down into, into their feeling of, inf uh, of inferiority by the, um, by the officers 
uh, and, uh, and they're kind of beaten into submission in some way, but they also share this great passion for England and for, for um, and their dislike of the French. And into this world of, uh, of hardship and military discipline, um, suddenly this angel, Billy, arrives. So there's already an overlap with Papageno. You can, there's this feeling of, of living in the present and, and being kind of blameless. That is a, a real a, a quality of Billy. And Billy begins to radiate goodness around him, so much so that his nemesis on board ship, Claggett, who's in charge of, um, of, of discipline on board the boat, Claggett immediately identifies Billy as being a threat to his existence and has to plot a way to destroy Billy um, and, and all he stands for. So Billy Budd stands for goodness and for blameless, blamelessness which makes him a very difficult role to play because he can very easily come over as being a cipher, of being a bit, being a bit um, bland, to be honest. So I, I've seen one or two productions of this and I've noticed there was a bit of a hole. There can sometimes be a bit of a hole where Billy Budd, the title character of the opera, should be. And Claggett, the evil one, um, uh, is a terrific character to play. No problem with... with uh, a personifying him on stage and Captain Veer the third part of this um, of, of this triangle who, who the captain of the ship who must decide between good and evil he's got a, a beautiful part to play very well fleshed out Billy um, well as this angel kind of a do-gooding angel we kind of we kind of get a bit bored of him and I I, uh, I decided that the best way to try and work Billy out was to see how dark I could make him, to see um, to see how violent a man he could be, and uh, I realised that uh, one of the things he does, and I'm sorry, there's going to be a small plot spoiler here towards the end of the opera, um, uh, when the confrontation between good and evil between him and Claggett reaches its climax, he instinctively strikes out. Uh, it doesn't mean to, he just instinctively strikes out and delivers one blow to Claggett and kills him outright. Uh, but it intrigued me that Billy has that capacity for violence. Billy is also a stammerer, which is why he has to strike out, because he can't speak. And Billy stammers only when other members of the cast um, let him down, disappoint him. They turn out to be not who he thought they was. In other words, they lie to him. When he realises they lie, that's when he stammers and that's when he strikes. And when he strikes, he strikes with full force. He is a man who knows violence and has probably, you know, he's an orphan. He's probably been beaten or he's had a tough life to end up at sea anyway, one can imagine. Um, and, and I realised that the, the most interesting thing about this angel, from my point of view, trying to work him out, was to see what capacity for violence he had. So uh, this then just le led me to think about what it is with the Roderick Williams, he's so nice thing, that obviously in all of us there is a capacity for good and for bad. I wouldn't say evil necessarily, but for, for good and bad. And uh, people's perceptions of us are based on, on whatever persona we like to put forward to them. Um, and I, uh, I do, I think I probably even choose, uh, I don't know to what extent it's, it's, it's fully conscious, but I choose to put forward that positive persona when I work because I feel I want to be surrounded by people being positive. And if I can do that, like Billy Budd, by shining positivity outwards, I feel it's that positivity that, that will come back to me. That is, that is my hope. And in the work I've done over the past 20 or 30 years, that has tended to be my experience. The more positive I can be, then the, the more will come back to me. But I am, of course, aware of the positive possibility for darkness. Let me have a little look at that for a moment. When I was a student at the Guildhall, just learning how to do opera and how to be other people, one of the big operas for me was The Rape of Lucretia by Benjamin Britten. Another Britten opera, there's a thing. Uh, and I got to play Tarquinius, 
who is uh, a young, hot-headed guy. Um, he's Etruscan in the in the in the in Roman times, and uh, so he's he's kind of uh, how can I uh, imagine him to be an Etonian amongst politicians, Etruscan to Romans. So he's he he feels privileged and. Also on this particular night, he gets quite drunk with his friends and a, a challenge come, comes up um, for him to go back um, to, to town and prove the virtue of Lucretia, who's married to Calatinus, um, uh, Tarquinius's superior officer. And, and I say prove the virtue, Tarquinius sets out on this drunken journey um, with the intention of proving her chaste because in his in the drunken argument um someone else says that you know oh i think the line is women are all whores by nature excuse my language for half past 12 but uh and tarquinia says no i will prove her chaste he rides back um uh, to lucretia's home and bangs on the door is is demanded entry and and is and is let in and that night the the alcohol the testosterone the feeling of privilege it all bubbles over and he commits an act of violence on her now i bring this up because um again in this safe space particularly in rehearsal it was a very interesting uh, uh, chance for me to explore um violence uh, that must be within me i think um, uh, and particularly against um, a, a fragile creature. And of course, the, the person playing um, Lucretia, uh, it was double cast, in actual fact, both women were, were very good friends of mine. And it was, so again, they trust me, I trust them. Um, and for us to explore where this goes. Now, I'll, I've got two photographs to show you here, and they're both in black and white. So there's a lot of um, uh, uh, chiaroscuro, uh, uh, images in darkness. So you might not be able to see details very well, but let me just show you as best I can. This is an image of, of, of me um, at the foot of Lucretia's bed, um, poised with a knife in my hand. There's a, there's a knife in this hand here. And Lucretia has just pulled the curtains down from the ceiling uh, to be around her, to protect her as I stand there. The, the line is poised like a dart. I'm, I'm ready to, to, to put the knife to her throat. And, and this is, image just comes just beforehand. This is, this is, where the curtains had been. I should have shown you these in the other order. Uh, this is me singing my aria. Um, I've managed to creep into her bedroom on this hot uh, summer night and she's lying there sleeping and you can see the curtains which she's going to pull down in, in a second all around and I'm just enjoying the moment of being there in the inner sanctum and, and being ready to commit this act, not really aware of what I'm about to do. Now, I bring this moment up in particular because it was a very interesting moment in the rehearsal. The, the two student singers, we were all students, who were singing Lucretia, um, the director suggested for this scene that they actually um, did the whole scene uh, without clothes. Um, and, and the audience weren't going to see any unfortunate nudity because she was going to rip the curtains down and cover herself up. But nonetheless, the feeling of vulnerability that she would have um, uh, being naked underneath these sheets while I'm standing there with this knife is something the director, you know, is all, all about method acting, isn't it, in the end? And he wanted to, to, um, to experience this feeling. It was all essential to the plot and, and what have you. And get, bearing in mind this is a student production, you know, it's not like you get paid an extra fee for, for doing um, nudity on stage and all that sort of stuff. So this was very much in a, in a student context. And it came to the rehearsal, the, the, the two women singing Lucretia were a, a bit ambivalent, but they weren't sure how they felt about this. But it came to a rehearsal where one of the Lucretias knocked on my door in the middle of the run. And she said, Roddy, just to say, when it comes to the next scene, the, the, the scene that leads up to the rape, incidentally, the safety curtain comes down and you don't see the rape. The rape takes place off, off stage. The actual act of violence is off stage. And uh, uh, the, the, my colleague came and knocked on my dressing room door and just popped her head in and said, Roddy, just to let you know that um, I, I, I'll, in today's run, I'm going to do it without any clothes, just to let you know. She thought, I think I've got the courage and, and we'll, we'll do this. And the, it came to this moment as the curtains came down and there is a quartet of, of singers there, it, it, uh, Lucretia, myself, and the male and female chorus who are observing this scene from either side of this picture. And it's unaccompanied. 
And as the curtains came down and she covered herself, and I stood there with this knife, and you can see that the, my hand there, as I hold this, this knife to her throat, I could feel the, the, the power and tension, the male tension in my arm of translating into this, into this knife as I was holding it to her there. And I suddenly noticed her dip out of the situation completely. Um, and she went doolally and the quartet became a trio. She just didn't come in at all. And for a moment, she was, she was not Lucretia. She was my colleague standing there completely vulnerable. And this, um, this was it, it, a, a very strong moment for me because I suddenly realized as much as she trusted me, I was still a man holding a knife to her. And uh, 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 I realized then, what did I realize? I, um, that I needed to deflate the situation for her to be able to come back and be a professional in, in the room. Uh, and I suppose it just helps me to, it, it had helped me ever since then to realize um, that as a man, I still have the capacity in, uh, for violence. It is part of my makeup that I'm, that it's hardwired into into me to be able to be, um, to be to, to, when necessary to access moments uh, uh, in a fight or flight situation to be able to access that strength. And it is a strength that can frighten me, uh, as well as her, that that this exists within me. I, I consider it something of a privilege that I was able to access that and see that part of myself in this play situation and to be able to defuse it and to be able to uh, joke with her afterwards and say well that went a bit funny didn't it and uh, and you know when when the safety curtain came down and the stage crew leave uh, stage management team led her away with a dressing gown you know the whole thing is diffused but it's it's very uh, i i found it very uh, um useful such a st stupid word very um interesting to take myself into those places in the knowledge that I can come back, I can step back easily. So I just feel I learnt something from that. And let me then move on from, from um, Tarquinius then to the baddest baddie that I've ever played, and that is Scarpia in Tosca. Uh, there are no photographs of this because it wasn't a fully staged production. This was at the Indelian Festival down in Cornwall um, in a church. Uh, and uh, it's quite a small venue, so uh, it's a huge opera, it's a huge role to sing, but I, it was manageable because the, 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 the space was small. Scarapia, in a sense, with Tarquinius that I was just talking about there, I was able to find the human and the good in him that relating to me in the same way that with Billy Budd, I had looked for the darker side of the angel. Take someone who's known to be good and find his dark side. Take someone everybody thinks is the baddie and find his good side, his normal side, his human side. You see what I mean? Just trying to blur the lines. Where does Billy Budd, uh, where do Billy Budd and Tarquinius overlap? And hopefully where that overlap is, that's probably more me than either of those two. With Scarapia, um, it's, I found it difficult, almost impossible to find the humanity in him. Scarapia is a character is again wonderful to play and isn't that interesting how such an evil man can be so uh, um, enjoyable to play but Scarapia is a man who has a very special skill anybody he meets he can pretty instantly see where their weakness is and how he can manipulate them by using that tapping into that weakness every character he sees their vulnerability and exploits it he's a man who who presses his thumb down on someone's weak, injured spot until they, they cry out. Um, and this sort of um, manipulative, sadistic streak is, is uh, I don't know, is it attractive? I, I, it's very hard to say. When you're considering such things, you, 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 it's, you, you find yourself in a very dodgy area. But... What I can say is that when I was saying to friends and colleagues, singing teachers or whatever, you know, and they say, oh, what are you doing this summer? I say, oh, I'm singing Scarpia down at the Indelian Festival. They would all look at me and say, oh, what, 
Roderick Williams singing Scarpia. You can't be serious, you know. You're far too nice to sing Scarpia. Yeah. So what I learned from that is that those people, those people who said I was far too nice, it almost urged me on to find, to, to explore the Scarpia within myself. Um, uh, 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 flirting with the dark side, as it were. Um, and uh, I, I, I found it easy to sing the role because you simply believe in what you say in the present and the text comes out and, uh, uh, and it's glorious stuff to sing. The, the work of, of inhabiting Scarpia as a person was done for me by Puccini and his librettists. So that was actually quite easy to do. Um, uh, inhabiting such a despicable um, character, uh, uh, that was less comfortable. Um, you know, you sometimes hear about um, actors who take on Hamlet for the first time, young, young actors taking on Hamlet, and how it makes them go a little bit do-lally. Uh, fortunately, I wasn't rehearsing Scarpia for, for such a length of time, so it didn't, um, it didn't kind of infect me in, in such a way. But... Um, you know those, yeah, particularly now, when you, when you come out of a bathroom, it says, now wash your hands. That was the feeling with Scarpia that having been in a rehearsal, having a performance with, with, with being, being inside this man, that at the end of the, this is me now washing my hands and, and, and throwing him away. Uh, nonetheless, as I said before about Tarquinius, uh, I feel a, it a privilege to have been able to look inside myself a shine a light into some hidden corners um, and and see what's there and see what parts of myself surfaced uh, when I was trying to be someone as as disgusting as as Scarpia and and be able to put them back having given them the light of day um, it's it's all for me about play therefore and all about being able to acknowledge that, own it, and then park it. So that once I come out into real life and chat to you now, hopefully you see more of the Papageno and Billy Budd than you do of the Tarquinius and Scarpia. That, I think, is the object of that. Um, let me just... Uh, 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 I've got um, one thing to say about song, and then I'll wrap, uh, I'll wrap this up. Um, in the song repertoire I do, which is on those shelves there as opposed to the opera over there, the song repertoire I do, um, uh, it gives me a chance to be different characters, often multiple characters, in a single evening. A, a, a recital programme might give me the chance to play uh, dozens of different characters and explore just what I've been talking about in a, in a whole range of, 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 of song. Uh, but more recently I've been exploring um, song cycles where I get to be a particular person for a whole range of songs and I'm thinking particularly of the great Schubert song cycles Die Schöne Müllerin, The Beautiful Miller Maid and Winterreise, Winter Journey and I've sung both of those in German and English quite recently which has helped me really access them. Um, the, Die Schöne Müllerin, The Beautiful Miller Maid where, I've, where I'm singing about being a miller, uh, a young man going off on a journey, leaving home, going off on a journey and finding somewhere else and then particularly someone else where I think this is where I'm going to spend the rest of my life. I found that a very interesting experience because, as I say, in my 50s now, I found it very interesting to try and access those emotions and that way of looking at the world that I think I had when I was 16 and 17, 15 even, you know, really quite, um, really young, fresh and, and ready to go. And it felt to me that in, in, when I sing Die Schöne Müllerin now, it feels to me that the world is in black and white. Things either helpful or they are no use to me whatsoever. Um, and um, uh, uh, I've just seen someone send a quick note there <laughs> about Don Giovanni. I have left Don Giovanni out, but I might come back to him. Um, it, it, it's an interesting story for me in this modern lens of the whole discussion of mental health I was just talking about earlier, because um, by the end of these 20 songs, the young Miller, this very sensitive um, uh, 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 chap, uh, has been rebuffed by the Miller maid. Again, spoiler, sorry about that. And it, to the point where he is contemplating, and perhaps even 
carrying out suicide, depending on how you see the last couple of songs. So this is this is a, a subject that uh, uh, is absolutely pertinent to today and pertinent particularly to my children. I spent a lot of time preparing um, Die Schöne Müllerin a few years ago, talking to my children actually about their current dating experiences, what it's like to try and connect with another human being in this 21st century, in this oh-so-sophisticated age. And, and, and hearing what they were, they, what they're telling me and how things are different to um, 300 years ago, 200 years ago, and how they are also completely the same. Uh, and I found what they were telling me and what I remember from my own inept experiences with the opposite sex, I found that all really infusing the way I perform, continue to perform that Schubert. Uh, and moving from there, from the Schöne Müllerin swiftly into um, Winterreise, Winter Journey, um, winter, the whole of Winter Journey, an hour and 10 minutes worth of singing, 24 songs by, uh, by Schubert, seems to inhabit the final few moments of the Schöne Müllerin, someone who has been rejected and then begins to obsess, self-obsess, begin to twist round in his mind um, uh, 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 these feelings of isolation and alienation um, and uh, everything that he sees on his journey whether it be a rock or a tree or a frozen river or uh, a bird or um, a leaf everything he sees he he observes and says my goodness I'm like that I am like that frozen river I am like that rock I am like that tree um, so it becomes self-obsessed in an extraordinary way um, and uh, uh, I found it very interesting to spend in performance um, uh, 75 minutes or so um, just going around in little circles inside my brain. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting for me to observe how a performance of Interizer, the, the lights seem to lower over, and over the whole hour and, and, a, and a bit. And the audience comes closer and closer until the whole thing is sort of pressing on my head. Uh, again, I find that hugely cathartic to have that experience. I have that experience in front of, of many people and they seem to join in on that experience with me. As we all just come into this tiny space, it's like the reduction of mass into one tiny little atom. And what I found most surprising is that at the end of it, when audiences are leaving and they say, oh, thank you very much and all that sort of stuff, mostly, um, I find their faces are shining with exhilaration, um, which is not what I was expecting at the end of, of Winter Journey, uh, that people are radiant um, from having gone through that uh, um, emotionally quite terrifying experience and certainly uh, uh, the concentration required of all of us the audience the pianist and myself is, is so super intense um, and then they come away shining and and do you know what this this leads me then to my last point that, that I wanted to make and that is um, kind of is a thought I had on my bicycle this morning, actually, about, about what it makes me happy, what enables me to be positive. Well, partly the sunshine and looking into my garden and seeing all the trees blowing the blossoms. Yeah, that makes me positive. I spend a lot of time singing about that, so it's useful to me to spend a lot of my time in it and experiencing it. But I realised, for a lot of us, we need things to be taken away in order for us to appreciate and value them. I think we've all done work that out for ourselves in the last few months. And for me, one of the things that's to be taken away is the audience, the interaction with other people, which is why it was so beautiful to see you all here on screen, so many faces on, on screen. Um, when I sing concerts, I've talked about rehearsals a lot and how the joy I get from that, but when I sing in concerts, the joy I get from the concert experience is, is, is singing and communicating to other people, seeing in the moment how what I'm singing about lands with them. I can see it in their eyes and the way they behave, the way they respond, and it feeds back to me and so it goes back and forwards. And singing in isolation here is, it, it has robbed me of that and I feel, I feel a frustration about that. It is this gift of sharing um, 
this amazing music, the um, sharing the uh, vibration of the air when I sing and make the music, and also the, the gift of sharing these intense emotional experiences with other people um, um, that I find gives me a great deal of happiness. I, I was worried that it was simply the applause at the end, hence that narcissistic bit I was talking about with all my photos. Precious, precious. Um, uh, but it's, it, it, it's not that. The applause, I get a great deal from applause. I would be lying if I said I didn't. But, but it is in the present, singing to other people, seeing their, their faces shine. In this room once, I coached a gentleman singing and he gave, he, he gave a performance of, of a song, a Paul Williams song, that didn't seem to go anywhere. So at the end of it, I said to him, I said, what do you want the audience to feel um, when you sing? And he thought about it, he said, oh, he said, I don't want them to feel anything. And this stopped me for a bit. And I said, that's un unusual. I said, what? Uh, I said, I don't think I've ever tried to sing a song and for the audience to feel nothing, to so feel numb. He said, no, no, no. He said, it's not that. He said, I just didn't realise that you could make an audience feel anything. And then I, I, we both had an epiphany um, that being able to share and change the mood of people in the audience, that is such a gift and 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 when even with winterizer when i go in with something that that is so well let's say depressing to for the sake of argument um to be able to change the mood and have people come out of a concert exhilarated that is something that i can take away and that can recharge me and help me to be positive and and happy there you are. Right. Um, so my 35 minutes, I see, has stretched to 48. It's not <laughs> I, did, I did say I would ramble, didn't I? But uh, off I went. But is there, is there, we have some time, I believe, in, in case anybody's got some questions, I will try and keep my answers brief. To the point. Well, if anyone's like me, Roddy, we're, we're all dumbstruck, really. Um. <laughs> Uh, extraordinary, extraordinary. Um, questions, please. Um, I she's got a hand up there. I've got a question. Is it all right if I just jump in? Um, so you sort of you spoke about people joining in in an experience um, and and sort of sharing feelings and all the rest of it. And outside of you know love for humanness or love for nature i i'd really i'd be really interested uh, as a performer myself i struggle with this and um, i'd be really interested to know what you think about the use of music and specifically song to keep outdated hierarchical ideas about gender roles race poverty religion um as experiential today in the present day i mean there's a lot of stuff that we continue to bring and continue to force people to experience uh, you know i mean they're willing but you know what i mean um also bearing in mind the almost exclusively male composer perspective thank you go. victoria that, that was a gift everybody by the way i didn't i didn't pay it i asked that question but it gives me a chance to talk about something that's coming up very shortly so i can like like any good politician i can just bend it to my own my own means um, Victoria, I can't answer all of that because, again, anecdotally, I don't have experience of, of all of that. But I do have a very specific experience of singing Schumann's Frauen lieben und leben, the life and loves of women. And uh, I'm preparing it again because I'm singing it at the Wigmore Hall in about two weeks' time. And I did this about two years ago or so. And this is a very particular piece because it, it is very specifically written by two men, the composer and the poet. And, and the poetry particularly, unfortunately, reinforces the patriarchal view of how women ought, in inverted commas, to behave in marriage, tra-la-la. And, and I read a wonderful um, uh, dismantling of the whole song cycle by an American academic whose name I've completely forgotten. I'm sure someone will know and remind me, and I can read it again. But there are many papers discussing the place of Frauen lieben und leben. The, our problem being that it is a glorious piece of music. 
uh, and the question, uh, the question that was posed to me by a wonderful woman whose uh, intelligence and, uh, 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 I respect enormously, the question really was, should it be performed? Because, as you say, it gives us a chance in recital to reinforce, if, I, if that's what I think your question is headed, um, to reinforce all the worst aspects of, of everything that's, um, that's, that's uncomfortable. Um, we, this academic and I pointed out that if the song cycle Schumann had written was uh, to do with slave ownership, and the songs had debated the merits of whether one uh, Negro slave was better than another, or their teeth and things like that, the song cycle would not be performable in this day and age, period. But because it's about women, then somehow we can, we, it gives us a, we can put it to one side and just say, oh, but it's such beautiful music. Okay, so I'll just put that out there as a, as a thought. But incidentally, um, there are far fewer songs I feel on my my shelves that that enable me to have that discussion about race than there are about gender. So maybe maybe uh, history has been a bit kinder to us in, in that respect. But with this in in particular, I continue to wrestle with this question, uh, and I continue in preparing this song this song cycle to perform again in, in a fortnight's time to think about the, all those aspects about what, is it, what it is for a third man now, not just the composer and the poet, but now the singer, to interpret these words and, and to find what truth I can find that is comfortable for me now in the 21st century in the feelings while taking a, a, a nuanced distance from some of the less comfortable aspects of um, of this young girl's behaviour to this oh so noble man, older man, whatever. Um, uh, I think I do a lot of that by talking to the audiences beforehand. When I did this last time and the time before, we had Q and A's after both performances, so that so that we could we could have it out as an audience. We could talk about it. I think sometimes just presenting something, saying there you go, this is a Schumann song cycle. Here it is. Bye bye. Um, didn't do anybody any favours, but uh, and I hope to, to, to talk about this more. Um, as part of the performance. It's a Radio 3 broadcast, among other things. It's all women's songs. And the whole purpose of my doing, I've, I've called the programme Woman's Hour. And it's, uh, I start with um, Gretchen am Spinrada, one of Schubert's most famous women's songs, and go on from there. And part of my purpose in, in programming a whole hour of women's songs is so that the rest of my song catalogue here is open to everyone rather than thinking okay for women what song cycles are there there's the, there's the schumann discuss there are a few songs here and there and then there's the, anything that's been written in the last 50 years by female composers well i'm hoping now that that we can bin that notion and that everything die schöne mullerin winterreise dichterliebe uh, where do we where do we want to start e everything is performable by any gender and hopefully, with, with that one step removal, it will enable us also to consider the texts in a, in, from our 21st century perspective and take what's useful from it and be um, comfortable in discarding what isn't. That was not a brief answer, everybody. Apologies. <laughs> Roddy, really, um, I mean, historically speaking, people always performed the music of their own day. Didn't they? You, you performed, um, you performed current music. Uh, nowadays, of course, we all perform stuff from all sorts of periods and all sorts of different sort of cultures. And it surely that that's uh, I, I'm sorry if that's an, an oversimplified explanation, but uh, that certainly would be my starting point. Really, of thinking that. Uh, but but also we, with Oxford Girls Choir, we've we've always worked with Finley female composers. I mean, you're one of the few exceptions as a non-female composer. Um, I do like promoting women's music, uh, but I, th I think mainly uh, I, I, I'm not being as profound about it as, as other people. I, ju I just think we, we need to. We just need to do it. I, I Incidentally and anecdotally and facetiously, um, when I first started writing um, close harmony songs for the, for the girls' choir to perform, you know, 15, 20 years ago, whenever it was, I wanted to, to find songs by female singers 
so the, uh, I just thought it would be fun for the, the, the girls to have a, a, a song book um, uh, of songs that were mostly associated with women. Well, associated with women. The only thing is, um, I thought that, that I can see clearly now it was sung by a woman because Johnny Nash just has a very high voice. <laughs> I, I, thought it was, I thought it was a woman. So I, I shot myself in the foot sort of day one. But apart from that, yeah. yeah. We did Biggie, Biggie on a Taxi this morning, Ronnie. Hooray! Yeah. <laughs> um, questions here. So Nadine, really interesting talk. I was wondering what subjects you studied at university, if you went, well, you, you did went. Yes, yes, I went, I went to Oxford a second time as a student and I studied music uh, uh, there with the intention of being a, a classroom music teacher, not of being a performer. I had no, I hadn't the imagination to have worked out that performing was possible as a career. So I went to, 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 to Magdalen in Oxford um, to get the broadest um, musical education that I could. Uh, and uh, I think that has, has stood me in good stead. Um, but I'll tell you one very brief thing, and that is having been created through Magdalen as a choral scholar and having studied it as a degree, sub, as a degree subject, um, when I got to the Guildhall about 10 years later, uh, my singing teacher said, uh, it's useful to come here, he said, because you'll see where you are in the pecking order. And I didn't, I didn't say even to myself that I thought I'd be somewhere near the top. But when I arrived, I found some singers there who made me realize uh, what singing could be. And some of them didn't even read music. One gentleman I know is dyslexic and, and had to be taught music. This Arius who's going to be sung, singing, he was taught it by another person, note by note. But once it was in, it was, it was totally in. He couldn't sight read to save his life, but when he sang, he could make me cry. And, and no one had ever made me cry by singing before. I, I didn't think that was what singing was for. Singing was for, you know, praising God or what, whatever it happened to be in, the, in front of me. But could someone t could, could, could move me by the way they sang? That was a learning curve. That was not, not really the question you asked, but I managed to change it. Sorry. <laughs> do, you want, do you want to answer Pepsi's question? Yes, um, yes. Um, some of the course of, uh, of Opera North, Don Giovanni, said that you were a very convincing sexual, sexual predator in that production. Um, I, I'm glad you mentioned that one. <laughs> Here is, here is, here's me uh, and uh, uh, Andrew Foster Williams, me in, in my bow tie and Andrew Foster Williams serving me at dinner as I, as I give you my very best, um, uh, uh, you know, public school um, privilege entitled Don Giovanni there. And once again, Opera North is a company, they were the company to give me my first um, uh, national opera uh, singing role. And they're a company with whom I have built up a great relationship. So I knew them and the chorus and the orchestra really well. So rehearsals there were more playing. And the unique experience, <laughs> you'll be glad to hear unique, unique experience I had working with them was that when I was in the rehearsal room, I was the highest status person on stage. And I was also irresistibly attractive to any and every woman on stage. Kind of, you know, kind of worked for me. And uh, again, it's about trust because they knew me and they trusted me. When rehearsals were over, when it got to the coffee break, the same person who had just been throwing themselves at my feet would just say, do you fancy a cup of coffee? And then we'd just go off and just chat like normal people. And that was a really useful thing for me to learn that, that the play stays in the playroom. And when it's finished, that was that. Uh, it, it enabled me to, to explore that side of myself, given that whenever I did that, I'd probably been married for 10, 15 years or whatever. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, for those of us, those of us who want to scratch a seven year itch and just think, mm, wonder what it'd be like, wonder what it'd be like to see, you know, you know. Well, I got my chance. I, I got my chance to work out what it'd be like to be a, a, a a sex bomb um, for a few hours on stage each evening, and then I I took I, I took that persona off and was Roderick Williams again. So quite useful. Can I ask a question about part that's sort of related, which is about parking things? Um, I heard a heard a um, 
a, a program on Radio 3 last week, and, and I don't know who was doing it, but they were talking all about suspensions and how the suspensions in music, actually, they create tension and then it resolves. And how that actually has something about therapy uh, in it. Mm. And, and what it reminded me of was something that I come across in my professional life. I'm a, I'm a psychiatrist. Uh, and this was an experiment. And it's an experiment that was done using rats. And essentially, if you give a, if you give a rat a tail shock, and, but that it can then, uh, uh, sorry, if you give a rat a tail shock that it can't get away from, it gets depressed. If you give a, a rat a tail shock that it can get away from, that it can escape, yeah. and then subsequently you give a rat a tail shock that it can't get away from, it doesn't get depressed. So, wow. so, so by having that experience of having something that you escape develops resilience. And, and that, I think, is a very fundamental mechanism that sort of speaks to all that play and your experience as Tarquinius. You know, you escape it, you come out of it, you come out of the rehearsal, you come out of this role, um, and, you know, you come out of a dire performance, you escape it, it's been and gone, and it leaves you resilient. Mm. Um, and so that's, for me, one of the great things about music. It, it, it's, it's there in the process, but it's actually there in the content of the music, in those suspensions, and that's why we love to cry, yeah. Um, yeah. because we, we escape it. I, I, that's a wonderful thing to hear and, and, and feed from. And it, 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 for me, it, your rats, and then for all of us experiencing music, um, when someone, and often my, often my children say, I just need to deal with that, or I just can't deal with that, dealing with it for me seems to be what your rats are experiencing. The idea of being able to be able to get out of a situation and then, then being stronger through that association. So, yes, I would guess that one of the things I've been able to do in my professional life, particularly through this rehearsals, this play, is deal with things. And I've been able to do it in, in a safe space and with the luxury of, of trustworthy colleagues around me. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, shocking my tail, I'm not so sure, but, uh, but yeah, otherwise, yeah. Um, sorry, I have a question. Please. Um, well, I'm just trying to think of how to word it. I'm just curious, do you think that younger actors with less experience might be more prone to having their mental health affected by their character? So playing a character with a darker mindset might actually affect a, an actor's personal like view of the world? That's, that is a very interesting question, actually, and particularly because this, the Guildhall School of, of Drama and Music, we have the drama students, well, until quite recently, the drama students were in with the musicians. So us opera singers would often see the drama students uh, uh, you know in the canteen and it seemed to me for reasons you could probably guess to do with vocal um, uh, uh, um, production vocal age that the opera singers were often older than the drama students by five to ten years so we saw really young people uh, uh, pushing themselves to the very edge of emotion exploring as, as I'm describing um, and Sometimes, sometimes exhausting themselves in that process, the very thing that you are, you are talking about. So um, given that I was a late developer and I was almost into my 20s and had been a classroom teacher for three years uh, um, before I got to the, the Guildhall, I, I it would certainly lead me to, to, to agree that um, delving to such places without experience to, 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 to draw on could lead to some issues. For me, it would be analogous to the rat being shocked on the tail without the escape. Um, and I can imagine, um, uh, uh, I can imagine that leading to difficulties. Therefore, I, I would guess it's up to the, um, the people who are running the sessions to make sure that the space is safe. I think that's, that, that was crucial to me to know that everybody trusted each other, not just the actors, but also the, the directors in my case, or the teachers in the case of the Guildhall, that we need to know where the boundaries are. When you know where the boundaries are, then you can step back and escape. And when, you, when, when the boundaries become fuzzy, I remember one lady, it's a two year course of the opera course, and she survived one year, because she would often take her character with her into the canteen. 
Uh, we were doing Albert Herring, and she couldn't she couldn't let her character alone. And I thought it was very interesting. And she she didn't have the resilience to to, to last it out. So I think there's a there's there's a lot of truth in your question. There's, there's something to be observed in your question there. Too. Thank thank you. Uh, any comments from any of our therapists in the audience? No. Phew! <laughs> 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 well, no, I, just, I just thought it, it might, might well be that, um, that I, would, I was going to be invoiced by one or two of them, but there you are. <laughs> and I'm aware of the time, everybody, so, so I, I, of course, I, of course, have nowhere to go to, so I, I, I'm not time dependent, but I understand one or two people are having time to leave. But Richard, if we have time for one more question, is it okay? Yes. yes. Uh, this is sort of the opposite of what Shahini was asking. She was asking about getting too deep in your character. Um, you, a lot of your examples that you gave were about singing the whole song cycle. So, you know, 45 minutes an hour or playing a whole role. Um, do you have any advice, especially for the girls here and younger singers, for finding that catharsis and that connection when you have maybe a solo that's like half a page long and sometimes yeah. it feels like it's passed you by. Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, yes, particularly for, for uh, I have this particular thing when I'm singing Wolf, uh, Wolf, Italianish leader book, the Italian songbook. The songs are very brief. And my feeling when I get to the end of each and every one is, can I do that again, please, right now? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, um, uh, part of this is about uh, performance of them and part of the, my reply would be about the preparation of them. For me the preparation of course you get more time to, to, to inhabit a song because it, you, you, you know you're, there's no time constraint in the same way. Uh, and Wolf, I just happened to pick him out, but Hugo Wolf used to compose songs by, by wandering around reciting them over and over again until he felt he had them in his in his face and then he would set them to music and i've grown hugely attached to the idea of reading the poetry out loud completely separate to the music um you don't have to do that first necessarily um uh, you can do that at any point but just living with the poem itself gives you a chance outside of the music experience to inhabit that space of that character that person and the reading of it out loud is very important because just reading it on the page is one thing that's useful but but declaiming it out loud without the music is just a great way to access whatever it is, is you want to access now then when it's when it's your chance to perform and you've got one page's worth of song to, to, to perform then for me it's the papageno experience about being able to inhabit the present um, i think when i sing that I have maybe time for two or three different voices, competing voices sometimes, to be with me in the moment. I've got the singery one, making sure I breathe in the right place and you know that everything matches up. And I've got the memory one, just trying to feed me the blessed text, if I can remember what word comes next, all that sort of stuff. I've got the one who's able to be, take a step back and look around and go, oh look, that lady's got red shoes on, you know, it's just in the middle of a show. And I'm like, Shut up, I'm trying to focus, you know, all this sort of stuff is, is going on. But, but there's a something about being in the present, and, and I don't always achieve it. But when I do, I suddenly get this nirvana moment of acknowledging that I am in the center of this song and, uh, and, and, and radiating whatever it is, whatever emotion it is, or sort of range of emotions I'm trying to do in, in that song. It is brief. That, that's kind of its beauty as opposed to an artwork on the wall. It, it is brief, but it's, it's worth my chasing. I, into my mind right now come a, a, a succession of pictures of times on stage where I've, I've had that. And they are the gold dust moments that, 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 I've, that time loses its, um, its measurability, for want of a better word. Sorry, that's badly expressed. But 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 uh, uh, but I'm there in the present and and in, I I can't think of any way other than to say total communion with the piece. You know, in in I think of a Rachmaninoff song where there's one or two Schubert songs that are one page that over like that. But when I'm there, I'm there. Yeah. Was that an answer? Yeah. No, that was good. Yeah. Right. yeah. 
Thank you, everybody. Um, so we'll put this this talk on on YouTube. Uh, there is a, a there's a playlist there called um, Saturday at Noon, so you can hear hear all the talks. I'm sorry I missed the first third of the the um, coronavirus talk. Um, I, I I was too wrapped up with the the technology. Uh, Ronnie, that was wonderful. Thank you very much. Absolutely marvellous. Well, thank you for being here. Yet again, you've done something wonderful for, the, for Oxford Youth Choirs. Yeah, well, I, I hope so. uh, it's been great fun to be with you all. Um, I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to see so many different faces after two months. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you, Roddy. Thank you. <laughs>